Beautiful. Hello. <laughs> um, welcome to our workshop. I can see we have about 30 people online at the moment, but I know that a few more people will join us as we go through. So can you all see and hear me at the moment? Can you give me a wave to let me know? Beautiful. Thank you so much. So um, we're really glad to have you with us this morning. My name is Nina Fromhold and I'm the Community Engagement Practice Lead with the Department of Premier and Cabinet and I'll be your facilitator for this session. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about facilitating virtual and online engagement because I know it's been top of mind for all of us who do engagement and the way we've needed to pivot our practice in the last couple of months. So before I get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands in, across Victoria in which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm working from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, uh, but I know that you're joining from all parts of, uh, of Victoria, all the way out from Bairnsdale through to Geelong, up to Bendigo uh, and many of the suburbs throughout um, Melbourne. So I pay my respects to the elders on the, on the countries in which you are located and to any elders who may be here with us today. So I'll start with a little bit of online housekeeping. We are recording this session today. So you need to make a decision as to how comfortable you are to leave your camera on, because if you are visible in the screen, you will be visible in our recording and we will be sharing this recording after the meeting. So please make the best decision for yourself. Um, the exception to this is our breakout spaces where we won't be recording those small conversations. And I encourage you to please use your microphone and your video so that you can connect with others in that session. So if you haven't already, please make sure your microphone is on mute and you can do that by hovering your mouse towards the bottom of your screen. It should bring up a little control bar and on that control bar is a device that looks like a microphone. If you click that, you get a line through it and you know that you're on mute. All right, so we have spent ages pulling this together, uh, planning the best experience we can for you, but sometimes we know things go wrong. So if you experience any technical difficulties, know that you'll be able to access the recording after the event, um, but also you can use the conversation function, which is also in that toolbar at the bottom of the page, looks a little bit like a speech bubble, so you can use that to share with us any of your worries throughout this meeting. We have Michael, Michael and Dane monitoring that conversation tab. So you can ask a question or let us know that you're having, having a difficulty. Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, and I'd like to do a bit of a check-in with you all about how you're feeling coming into this session. So I'm going to ask you to use that conversation button at the bottom of the at, at the bottom of your page in the toolbar there to post a GIF or write a comment, or you can make a hand signal, or you can show us a piece of paper to tell us how you're feeling today. So go as fast as you can. Awesome. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So it's a pretty positive group today. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'm I'm really pleased to be here as well. So this is great. Um, those comments may keep dinging through for a minute, so we'll ignore that and move on. Um, can I get you to hold up your fingers to indicate how many online meetings or workshops you're going to today? All right. So I want you to think about that when you answer the next question. 
I want you to give me a nod for yes or a shake your head for no. If you were offered the opportunity to go to an online meeting after hours about something you passionately care about right now, tonight, would you go? <laughs> All right. So I, I wanted you guys to see that and share that with each other um, because that's really our role at the moment is how do we get people engaged and interested when, like us, they're probably spending at least 50% of their day in an online forum of some sort. Okie doke. Well, I'd like to introduce you to the team I have working with me today. Uh, so, Michael Baranovic, can you give me a wave, please? Awesome. And Michael Alisi. Uh, very good. So Michael and Michael are from Engage Victoria and they're going to be supporting us in the background today. Our keynote speaker is Amelia Loy. Amelia, give us a wave. She's the managing director of Engage2 and she's got some fantastic material to share with us today. And in the background, we have Dane Murray who is doing our technical and event support. So thank you to Dane. Okay, so in terms of our setup today, we're going to ask you to go between three online spaces. So this forum we're in now, we're going to refer to as the main video or the main forum. Um, our keynote and all of our whole of group discussions will take place here. So the second place that we want you to go to is an Engage Victoria page. So we're going to pop that link in the conversation tab now. Uh, calling on Dane. Thank you very much, Dane. Um, so if you can please click on that Engage Victoria link and open that up either on your second device or using those instructions there on the screen now to split your screen so that you can see the two things at once. So we're going to be going between this conversation here and the Engage Victoria page. All right, and the last place that we're going to be going to is a series of breakout spaces, and we'll guide you through how to get to those breakout places when we're, th when we're there. All right, now in terms of that split screen slide, right back at the start of the conversation tab, you can find an image of that that I posted in at the start of this meeting. So if you're still trying to work all of that out, you can go to that image in the chat and keep working on it in the background. Okay, so for now, you should have this meeting open and the Engage Victoria page open. I'm gonna do a quick recap of our agenda today. So we're really lucky to have Amelia with us to share some of her insights uh, and expertise. Then we're gonna do a Q&A with Amelia. After that, we're gonna break into discussion groups and focus on six of the topics that you suggested to us uh, when you registered for this event. So those breakout topics you can see on the Engage Victoria page there. Uh, and if you scroll down, you can see those. We've got reach and inclusion, getting people engaged, virtual facilitation, online facilitation tools, and engagement now. So how do we focus on what we're doing in engagements at the moment? So there'll be your options for later. At this point though, I'd like to pass this over to Amelia Loy. You're on mute, Amelia, please. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Number one rule for presenters, make sure you can speak to everyone. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me here, Nina. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And also thank you to Michael, Michael and Dane for all their support getting organised for today and the facilitators who have offered to support us also with the breakout sessions. Um, it's thank you for making time. You know, the, we're all going to lots of these kinds of meetings during our day. And I really appreciate you saying yes to this one. And also for your feedback on registration. It's, um, it's always humbling to speak to community engagement professionals and read about what they're doing and what they're interested in. Um, so uh, please 
Um, I'd like to acknowledge you guys also as elders in the Engage Victoria community and say that I'm very grateful to be here with you today and excited to be learning from you as well. Um, and please let me take a moment to introduce and acknowledge the uh, elders of the land on which I'm meeting you from. I'm coming to you from Manly in the northern beaches of Sydney, Australia, and the, the traditional owners of the land here are the Garingai people. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their uh, past, present and future, and also um, acknowledge all of the elders here with us today. So just give me a second and I'll gonna share with you my screen. There we go. So as Nina said, I'm coming to you from an organisation called Engage2. Uh, the organisation's been around for seven years. I founded it to uh, work with people who I respect and really wanted to learn from and form um, teams with to deliver better projects. So I, I've had about 20 years community engagement experience working with government, um, mostly in the environmental policy area and also urban planning area. So I got into the use of technology for engagement around about 10 years ago. Um, and it started off with me just wanting to analyse feedback from the community and be able to report that, particularly in triple bottom line assessment. So looking at social data and how that could be weighed up and valued against economic and environmental data. Um, that was my sort of foray into the use of technology for community and stakeholder engagement. And then, of course, it extended into online engagement with the introduction of social media and all of the wonderful tools that I'm going to introduce uh, to you today. And now, of course, I'm learning a lot more about virtual engagement and how do we integrate um, some of these technologies for community and stakeholder engagement online and offline into the way we do things virtually. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, our objectives for this session are to introduce you to a range of different types of digital engagement. Uh, I'll do that very quickly and then I'm going to go into the tools that are available. Um, but I want to highlight that you guys have access to an incredible toolkit already, Engage Victoria. So in the design of today's session, we've really preferenced the use of that tool and how it can be used with the other tool that you've got available for virtual engagement, Microsoft Teams. So hopefully you learn a few tricks through the process as well as through me sharing what I've been learning as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about designing and planning digital engagement. It's a little bit different. It's a definitely an extension of planning a usual community and stakeholder engagement. Uh, and then, of course, some, some uh, I'll highlight a little bit around how we do that virtually, what's important to consider virtually, and then integrating the different techniques, which you'll experience today. I hope you like my image here because this is um, this is for me is very symbolic of what it's like to try to get a handle on all the different types of technologies available for stakeholder and community engagement. Um, at the moment, I have 79 tools in my database that I feel comfortable being able to talk about. Um, at, at one time I had 120. If I include open source tools, um, there's definitely a lot more than that. And if we start including some of the larger sort of collaboration tools that are used for in-meeting engagement, there's even more than that. Um, the 79 that are in my database currently are tools that are currently being used by governments that speak English as a first language uh, for, and they're being used for stakeholder and community engagement. It's, it, I hope you can appreciate and uh, not having English as my only language. Sometimes it's hard to find other tools that uh, governments are using in Spain and um, obviously across some parts of Europe where they're, they're only actually presenting that product in that language. So, so I'm probably missing a few, um, but these 79 products are being used by governments around the world for community and stakeholder engagement. Um, to help me, I'm going to introduce a couple of tools that help me make sense of that market and really break that down um, and how I use them. But uh, the first thing that I realised during COVID is that we really have to break down um, the language that we're using around digital engagement because digital engagement and engagement technology and online engagement were being used interchangeably. And um, 
of course now with COVID, we've now got what I'm calling virtual engagement, which we're, of course we're doing right here and now. So virtual engagement is engaging in real time life. Online engagement is engaging online and you can do that during a virtual engagement, but you can also do it anytime online. So a lot of tools are configured and set up just for online engagement. And this one's often missed, offline engagement. And I'm quite excited about offline engagement, even though we've got COVID. So if you come into the breakout group engagement now, that might come up a little bit, um, but I won't talk about it too much in depth in this presentation. But offline engagement is where you put tech into a community or you take tech in person to a community. Um, so, and I think there's some nice little secrets in there for how we increase reach uh, and include people who are not so comfortable with tech uh, or are in regional areas and, and don't have as reliable connections as what we do. So the three types um, that I'm talking to at the moment are virtual engagement, online engagement and offline engagement. This slide uh, is what I call the Engage Tech Spectrum and you'll all no doubt be familiar with the IAP2 spectrum. Um, so that's Really, I've taken the, the high level purposes for engagement that the IAP2 speak to, inform, consult, involve, collaborate and empower. And I've looked at the 79 tools that are available uh, in my, you know, that I'm aware of at the moment being used by governments. And I've broken them down into these subcategories underneath those headings. I've been using this tool since 2013. And I run an event where people who are using different technologies uh, in those categories talk about their experiences using them. And I do that because it, it's that slippery dip, it, those, that water slide. It's really hard to get a handle on all the different products and you don't really understand them until you've actually had your hands in them. So if anybody's actually used um, the Engage, well, I know a lot of you have used the Engage Victoria Suite, you really don't know what you're getting and what it's like to run an engagement on an engagement technology until you've been hands on with it. Um, so I, I run these events and use this image to help people define uh, their purpose for engagement, um, what they're trying to achieve by using that particular engagement tool. So that tool in your Engage Vic suite in this instance and why you're using it at this stage in your project. Um, so there's there's a lot of tools in each category, believe it or not. Um, so listening and understanding, uh, the most simple example of that is monitoring social media. So it's scraping data, it's getting a, a sentiment from the community about the topic, and then it's using that uh, to inform your engagement or your project. Um, for some people who don't do engagement, that's enough, uh, they think, to get community sentiment. Um, but for those of us doing engagement, we're probably looking at this spectrum as a, and the tools that are available as something that we might use at different stages of planning our engagement uh, and also um, potentially even for different types of stakeholders in our process. And so recruiting is, is of course how we get people to come to our online engagement and some of the tools that are available on the market like the Hive which is running your Engage Victoria suite uh, or Bang the Tables Engagement HQ, they provide what I call uh, I like, it's the toolkit, it's the engagement house and it's got lots of different rooms for engagement and it also captures a database of people who have been engaging with you so that you can proactively engage the people who have told you that they're interested uh, in a particular topic. Um, so you might use those tools to promote and recruit or you might use uh, MailChimp, Campaign Monitor are really popular, um, but this category also includes how you get savvy about promoting your engagements, um, even using social media and how creative you can get in that space. So there's lots and lots of products of, around to do that. Um, we're now seeing a big increase in the use of things like TikTok, and, <laughs> um, which is really you know, fun, but it's not exactly a very useful tool for deeper engagement. So the World Bank, World Bank use terminology like thin and thick engagement. It's certainly not thick engagement when you're just posting a video um, and promoting uh, your engagement. But um, I like to use a phrase called fish where the fish are and bring them back to the aquarium. Um, it's come to me from a colleague called David Ede, so it's not mine, but it's been incredibly useful to help people understand the value in pro 
being really savvy about promoting your engagements, um, both in place but also um, online, and then getting people to come back to spaces where you can get them to engage a little bit more deliberatively a bit and engage with content a bit more, so get them engaging in a thicker way. Um, and perhaps looking at other people's viewpoints as well. And the other benefit of doing that is actually it's a space where you can really capture data. Um, so all of these techniques from crowdsourcing across to the right hand side are where we start getting into online engagement tools. And all of them, believe it or not, I was having a look at the Engage Tech suite last night again and thinking, would you use all of these tools within your virtual engagements? And you can. You can actually use um, any crowdsourcing and prioritization. A lot of the tools can be used virtually as long as they live update, if that makes sense. So you're engaging virtually. Or you can use your virtual engagement to drive traffic, fish to fish, and bring people back to the aquarium and use these tools for online engagement. So crowdsourcing and prioritization is really obvious to all of us here. So I'm not going to go into that too much, but you might use a map, map-based engagement. In your Engage Tech Suite, you've got Gather, Visioner, you've got Conversation. If you want to get a little bit thicker and get people sort of engaging with each other a little bit more, um, getting into that discuss and visualize space is really interesting. Um, and you want you want to be using your forums. Um, the and Nina, one of the groups, is going to be hosting a discussion about how to engagement online, particularly um, how do we get people engaged through online forums. And that's kind of a different skill. It really does require um, not just moderation, um, but if you really want to get good engagement, it requires facilitation. So I think online facilitation um, is an even different skill to virtual facilitation. Um, it, I will just introduce on the right hand side. So collecting feedback and submissions is really obvious. Again, that's that's your consultation. And the name of the game here is how do we get people to engage with our content? Um, so one of the things that really frustrates me about the tools that are available in the market is they don't encourage that thick engagement here. So I actually really like it when you can present a little bit of information and then ask some questions and then present another little bit of information and then ask some questions. So some really good tools now that are experimenting with the, the way to try to incre in increase deliberation and encourage deliberation online. And I think we're going to see a really big expansion of that now that there's more investment being made into the use of technology for engagement. On the far right side is Involve, Collaborate and Empower. And believe it or not, these are the ones. So while you can use uh, Experience Co-Design Budget and you can use Co-Create and Co-Deliver tools virtually, they're the ones that require more ongoing engagement, uh, more continuous engagement from participants, of course, because you're wanting them to collaborate. So you're wanting them to keep coming back. So they're probably the less suitable for virtual. You, you might use them in one instance to introduce people to them, but then you want to come back to them and really get people engaging more deeply with those kinds of tools. Um, in saying that though, you can actually use them for real time engagement. And that's the next slide we're going to go to, which talks a little bit more about what I'm now calling collab tech, because it's kind of its own subset where you can do virtual collaboration in real time. But you're mostly going to do that with team, with your own team or maybe with a reference group, you're less likely to do that in community engagement. Empower and um, building community is more about um, building a momentum around a community. And you can do that both online and complement your offline engagements, of course. Some really cool new tools coming out around that or older tools that people are starting to invest in. And it's mostly being um, um, developed as an industry through the not-for-profit not sector and also, honestly, community um, uh, activism. The bottom lines are really important. I'm only going to mention them very briefly, but they'll come up again as, as we speak through the next couple of slides. And it's about managing information and issues collected through engagement and managing relationships. It's really critical to be thinking about this whenever you select any, any 
tool, of course, or any method for engagement, and if, especially if you're doing multiple methods at once, because you want to be able to take a snapshot in time and be able to reflect back to the other stakeholders that weren't able to engage with you virtually or online, what's coming up, and of course, report back to your project team internally as well. Um, before I move on, I know people want to talk about tools, so I'm just going to very quickly say that there, you've got MS Teams, of course there's Zoom, um, there's Meet and Hangout, Jitsi, Crowdcast, Amplify and Event Apps. So there's a whole category here of almost, I'm, I'm actually really thinking there's another category of event apps or virtual app event apps and how you use them. And I know you guys have access to MS Teams, so I don't want to labour the point here, but one of the things that we've, Dane and I have been playing around with is how do we enable more movement, open space, participation during those virtual events. And we've been able to come up with a workaround with your MS Teams instance, which Nina's going to talk you through later. So hopefully that introduces some of the questions that you might want to ask during our question session today. Um, but you can, there is a workaround in every product, but it's not smooth is, is the short answer. And if you're wanting to have an event with lots of people in lots of rooms at once, I recommend considering an event app as well, or how you might configure a place where people can figure out how to move to different rooms, which we've tried to do it in an engage tech today. Sorry, sorry, engage Vic. I'm looking at the clock and I'm not going to talk for too much longer. Uh, and this slide was not meant to be spoken to. It was meant to be introduced and it will be shared. Um, so will the Engage Tech Spectrum. Um, the point that I want to make here is that these tools can be used um, when you're in person, sitting in a room with people uh, and also engaging them to collect data from them in real time uh, or collect feedback and get them participating in real time. I'm sure many of you have used Slido and Poll everywhere. Nureva, uh, sorry, Nuvera, I always do that, um, you can text into as well. So that's actually a really cool uh, um, product. It's quite a comprehensive and more expensive product, but it has some really great features if you want to work with people during a meeting and also enable that texting in. Um, each of the tools in the bottom left can also be moved forward into the other two um, categories, which is virtual engagement and engaging people outside the room. Obviously, with COVID, we're now opening up a little bit more. I think we'll start to see a bit more of those hybridised events where we have people in person and people also outside of the room engaging virtually. Um, here are some ways that you can do that. And then finally, um, you want to be thinking if you are collaborating and especially running communities of practice or stakeholder reference groups, you want to be thinking about how you're um, working with stakeholders. So some of those tools in the right hand category are better at continuing your engagement. So I'm now looking at the market and thinking how do we break up those products and categorize them in a similar way to what I've been doing with the engaged tech spectrum. So um, this is really critical, designing and engagement, designing and planning your virtual engagement. I've deliberately got a uh, design thinking tool up there. So uh, if you're not familiar with design thinking or co-design methodologies, I recommend having a play around with them. Um, I, it's not the answer to every problem, in my opinion, and I think people use co-design too, too easily um, and not really respect the concept um, very much. But design thinking is an incredible tool, even in everyday community engagement, and it's particularly useful in virtual engagement and when planning events. So when I do an, an agenda for an event, I actually think about who's coming to the event, but I and I think about what they're thinking, feeling, seeing, doing, what I want them to be doing, but also what are their pains, why are they coming to the event, what's in it for them, and work through every single step of my agenda thinking about that. And when I do in-person events, I try to curate the experience for them when they're coming into the room. And we're now, uh, Dane is my space man <laughs> or space maker to be gender neutral. And we're playing around with how do we really design in engagement and these virtual engagements, taking this into account with every single moment when people come in. And of course you can do this with online engagement, but we're having a lot of fun playing around with how to do this with virtual engagement, um, including things like um, planning to have live musicians in one of our events, 
Uh, we're also looking, as I said, at event apps. Um, and there's a bunch of different things that you can do when you're planning your engagements and thinking these things through. Um, I want to I want to step to the next one because of time and I'm going to go into some detail in that. Just mostly the virtual engagement piece. So spaces, bringing people into spaces, so facilitating virtual engagement. You have to make the space. So like Nina did this morning, she really talked you guys around the virtual tool. She really thought about what it's like for you to come in. She set the tone. She asked you to check in. She invited your engagement and orientated you to the tool and encouraged your participation by really sharing that agenda with you. I've also seen some other people do some cool stuff like open up with a poem that's really relevant to the topic. Um, and, you know, depending on your audience, some people are really keen to do kind of almost a meditation or let go of something. So you might get people to write something down that they've got to leave behind and then tear it up and throw it in the air. <laughs> and the coolest um, icebreaker that I've seen, and you probably can't do it in a big community engagement, is um, scissors, paper, rock uh, tournaments. <laughs> um, so it's worth tr like playing around with some tricks. Um, there's some magic numbers in virtual engagement. You can see now nine boxes in MS Teams. That's a magic number. It's um, it unfortunately doesn't have the same features of Zoom where you can click through the gallery room. One of the things I love about Zoom is you get 25 bo um, magic boxes of people's faces and you can click through to different um, screens to see different, pe uh, different sets of people coming in. Um, so there's lots of potential there. Um, I think the other thing is to think about engagement as two-way or three-way. Do you want participants to be engaging with each other, which of course can be really, really useful in community engagement, especially if you're trying to encourage thicker engagement. Um, so it's really useful to think about your breakout spaces. And as I said before, we've tried to do a little bit of um, movement, like World Cafe style. We're only going to do one movement um, this time, but you can do your World Cafes and bring those kinds of techniques to these um, engagements, but you've got to really design for it. It takes time and planning and designing and testing um, and testing those experiences is really, really important. And I'd also highly recommend having a, a facilitator and a coordinator. Um, if you need help advocating for that, Nina will definitely back you up. She's not, I can see, she's the only person I can see on screen at the moment. I can see her nodding. Uh, so she'll definitely back you up with that. But also I've got a blog on my website which um, speaks to the definition, the glossary of terms that I, I've spoken to today about virtual, online, offline engagement and some of the other language I've been using, but also tips for virtual engagement and um, these in particular these roles. So when I create spaces, I have a facilitator, a coordinator, and I also have breakout facilitators and coordinators. So again, thanks to everyone who said yes to helping out with that. Um, it's really important. One of the questions we got asked was, how do you get people truly engaged in these events? You give them a role or you ask them questions. That's really the key um, and the more variety in the format. Um, so having balance between your content and your process is really critical. Um, I've got so many points I could talk to about this and hopefully I'm giving you enough to provoke some questions because I really want to get to that part of the uh, agenda. Um, but the main thing here is this, like Nina said, when she asked you that question of how many meetings are you coming to today and would you go to something that really interested interests you? This is an investment and we're all really choosing where we put our time very carefully these days because it's eating into our personal lives and personal space. Um, so, and I think time and those relationships are really important. So uh, I encourage anyone who's doing these kinds of events to be, um, think, think about the people who are coming in the room, think about the investment that they're making, what do they need to get out of the event, um, how are you going to make sure they got value out of the event, and also maintain engagement. I've got a drawing on the page in front of me, and instead of closing the loop, I'd like to encourage you to think about the double helix. That's the closest shape that I can think of at the moment for me that represents what engagement is becoming. Um, it's very rarely, especially if you're doing, even if it's just a project engagement, it's very rarely just a, a single point in time that you're going to have an engagement with that person. So thinking strategically about how you manage those relationships and continue the dialogue and perhaps even deepen the engagement, um, I think will really enrich your projects and the experience for your participants. 
Nina, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk too much. Like it's already seven minutes past eleven, so I'd like to invite questions at this point, if that's okay. Um, now you're muted. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm going to take, take that off. Um, let's give Amelia a yeah. virtual clap, please, and thank her for that. Um, and yeah, we will go straight into questions. I just wanted to say thank you because I was really impressed with the way you link the tools and the spectrum um, and also the empathy mapping. I find that particular process really useful for thinking out, thinking out where are my participants coming from. Uh, before they come into the room. So really beautiful content there. So I would like to put it to the room. While we have Amelia here with us today, what else do you want to know? Uh, and the way that you can let us know um, is you can put your hand up in the conversation. Ah, Belinda's already done it. Gorgeous. Um, so I'll call on you in turn uh, to speak to your question if you're happy to do that. So we will start with Belinda, please. Thank you. And thanks for um, being so open about forgetting to unmute yourself. I need to give myself a dollar for every time. Um, so the question I have, um, I guess, for me in doing a lot of online engagement with um, at risk communities is that I'm struggling with providing the same level of psychological safety in the sessions that I'm running. Um, the virtual space, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that and I, I'm just curious, curious to learn how to do that a little bit better for my groups. Yeah, it's a really niche question, Belinda, but I'll do my best. And, you know, your, this is your, this is, these are your stakeholders and your processes, so you know, probably know a little bit more than me and it might be worthwhile speaking to others that are, have similar um, kind of stakeholders that they engage with regularly. Um, I think the breakouts have a lot of value. I think uh, um, there's a, in some tools you can do random breakouts, which I quite like. Um, it can be confronting, um, but you can give people permission to turn off their, turn off their video. I think that's really important. Nina did that really well at the start of this meeting. Um, I think different methods of participation and being upfront about recording. That's probably the best you can do. Um, and you might want to have, think about the role of your coordinator and if they can perhaps have some other skills. So that are um, perhaps maybe trained in some areas where they can care a little bit more and facilitate people through um, anxiety around the use of these tools. That's yeah. three really great tips. Thank you. Nina, you're on mute still. Did it again. Oh, okay. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? You can either let us know in the conversation tab or use the, the hand, the raise your hand button to say you'd like to speak. Oh, come on, we're a shy bunch today. <laughs> Is anybody typing into the conversation, Nina? I'll have a quick look oh, over there. Hang on, Sue has a question. If we can go to Sue, please. Thank you. Um, I'm not, do you want me to switch my video? I can. I, you're just on my mobile because I'm uh, multitasking with another Teams meeting, which is recording in the background on my laptop. <laughs> That's okay, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah good, good. Um, my question is, so we've had to do a lot of, a lot of virtual workshops. Um, there's smack bang in the middle of a big project. We've got people who are in, from the project team who are in Manila and India. Um, and we've had a lot of stakeholders in these workshops. It's been very intense. Now, my question is, when, and I don't know whether this has been covered already because I joined a little bit late. So my question is, how do you manage when you've got a focus group, let's say, a set of uh, part participants, and there's one that kind of dominates? How do you manage that situation in a virtual environment? So can I clarify, is it, are you engaging with the same people repeatedly? Yeah, these are workshops for a project, so it's the same focus group, yep. 
Yeah. Yeah, um, I would be having a conversation outside of the group with that person <clears throat> and yep, um, and just suggesting that they, um, you know, it's really wonderful to have your contribution in the next call. Um, can I give you this item on the agenda? So mm -hmm. definitely give them a role in the event. Uh, um, mm. Yeah, but also try, try and obviously different people are going to be more receptive to this than mm. others. Um, but try to um, encourage them to uh, want to hear from other people, like, and 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 really state that that's you, that you're really keen to hear from other people in the group. That you feel like um, it's been wonderful to hear their viewpoint. Um, but we'd really like to make sure that we're getting a diversity of views in every single call. That's probably the best you can do. And then, um, and then use your normal facilitation techniques. So. You know, if, if people are comfortable with video, generally they're comfortable if you were to say, hey, Michelle, we haven't heard from you. You know, you've been on the call the whole time. It'd be really great to hear your opinion as well, just like you would do in, just like yeah. you would do in a, yeah. in a workshop environment. When, yeah, when we're in a, yeah. Like, in person, yeah, in a real, yeah, in so, real life, um, real life. <laughs> yeah, and, and build a little bit of fat into your agenda so you can be flexible like that. So great. that's one of the things Sounds I add. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess the other thing I'd say is think about you know, the variety of Q&A options available to you. So Nina, we're using the currently using the raised hand. Um, you've yep. also got an invitation to go into the chat um, and let people know that they can either, you might have like a tool where people can silently post things online, which you're going to experiment with in some of the breakout groups, or okay. maybe break people out into small groups before the question period and then invite them to come back with one question. So if you've got 100 people on the call and you have groups of 10, the group of 10 has to bring it back down to 10 questions. So that's one way to really get more people in the call participating and give them a bit more air, air time. You know, try to, to distribute that airtime and make space and, and enable um, methods for people to participate in a way that suits them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got a couple of people in the queue now. So we've got um, Dominique. Um, would you like to speak to your question or would you like me to do it? Oh, no, I'm happy to. I'll pop my video on so you can see a face. Excellent. So I'm trying to, um, for some context, I'm sort of trying to pitch an idea. Um, I'm from Office for Women and we want to do a virtual panel discussion with um, some uh, sort of for women in leadership sort of um, theme and just trying to come up uh, is it new for us to organise like an, a, vir a virtual panel discussion? So just wondering about any sort of key tips and also how to, you know, we're quite across how to find a facilitator for an in-person event, but what to look for for an online facilitator that, you know, you want to be able to cope with what could go wrong in a virtual environment and, yeah, just so any tips are welcome. Well, um, cool under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Like does go wrong, um, and if they, if you can show some evidence of your work, I think, I think it's really important that we do start having maybe even looking at a couple of videos and seeing how people are. I know that kind of puts the pressure on all of us a little bit as facilitators, but it's it's kind of the nature of this kind of business. Um, and if especially if they can speak to a specific example where things went wrong. You know, it's a really great interview question that we kind of have to deal with in a job. So I think we've probably got to we've probably got to be honest about that, um, and and really look at the qualifications of their coordinator as well. You know, my space maker. You mm -hmm. know, Dane's been fantastic for me to have on my team. I really value that, and and I value that service. And I think if you're an engagement professional hiring facilitators, I think we need to set the standard for valuing that as a service because it's been undervalued for a long time. And um, those people who are at the back of the room really, really backing us up and building our confidence as facilitators. Panel discussions are really hard, Dominique, on virtually. I haven't quite nailed that yet. I'm going to be entirely honest with everyone around that. You can only have one person speaking at a time. So <laughs> um, I think you've really got to put a lot of time into coaching your panellists yeah, and making yeah. sure that they understand the time limits. Um, give them, you know, three questions to answer. Perhaps start by asking a single question and ask every panellist mm -hmm. of that question or say, I'm going to ask this first question to two panellists, but then I'm going to defer. So really being clear, it's almost like have a mini agenda and be transparent about that with the yeah. um, panel. That makes um, sense. 
Yeah, and again, it probably goes back to the question we had from Sue, even ahead of time, ring them and have a chat with them about their role. Make sure that they know that you really want to hear from everybody and this is the stuff we really want to hear from you, if that's okay. Okay, okay. that's yeah. great advice. Thank you. Excellent. Now, speaking of time, we're going to need to move a bit quickly. We have, um, I'll, I'll go to one more question and then we'll go on to our breakout spaces because I want to make sure we get there today. Uh, so, Holly, is it Holly or Bree? The, the name says uh, both. Yeah, it's Holly and Bree's here as well, but um, I'll ask the question. Lovely. Um, so we're from GWM Water. Um, we are looking at holding a stakeholder forum um, in this format. So we're thinking about doing a Teams meeting, um, using the chat function, pretty much how you guys have got it set up. But we were just after recommendations about um, getting people to register beforehand to know who's coming. Um, so when we do our stakeholder forums in person, um, we send people letters and uh, get them to register with the call centre or by emailing us. Um, but obviously doing it virtually is a bit different. So do you have recommendations, whether it be a form on the website or calendar invites or yeah, what's the best way about to go about getting people to register beforehand? Calendar invites are my favourite. They have to be part of the process, I think, because... Um, I just it really sucks when you know you've got something on and it's not in your calendar and it's so easy to forget especially at the moment while we've got so many meetings um if your purpose is to let participants know who else is coming um that you know a calendar invite like be careful about how you send your calendar invite i guess i'd say because it can be an indicator of everybody else is coming and their contact details um if it's not, if your purpose isn't, and it's more about getting people to register so you know who's coming and you've got some information about them, I really love asking questions on registration. Um, we used Humanitix for this event. It's free. It's, if your event is free, it's not otherwise, but they do um, give any ticket revenue to charity. Um, you can pick a couple of charities, but it's only a select number of charities that meet a criteria. Um, I use that for my events at the moment because I like the way you can ask questions through the um, event registration process and it integrates into people's own calendars so they can hit Outlook or they can hit Google Calendar and it goes straight into their calendar if they want to. So actually quite, for me, that's a really nice user experience. The only thing that's missing from that, if I, you know, think about your product suite, MS Teams and Engage Vic, I would love to see you be able to invite people through EngageFit because then you've got your database of your stakeholders already there, which you can then access to promote um, to other other tools to engage on that project um, to them. So or other projects to them. So that's you know that's my wish list on the product dev cycle for the Michaels and and the Hive team. Um, I'm sure that they've they've already got that on the list, and hopefully now that we've got more people using the products. Uh, there's be some, you know, even more investment. It's a great tool though. You're really lucky. I've got to say two things before we go off questions. It's world leading what you guys are doing in Victoria when it comes to the use of engagement technology. It's absolutely world leading. It's a comprehensive approach. It's I have not seen a single government that's looking at this in a holistic way and providing this service to every agency. And you're really lucky you've got some very, very capable people in your team. I'm not just blowing smoke here. Um, I, I do my events across Australia and New Zealand and I also work with lots of colleagues around the world and it's really impressive. So you're very, very lucky to be able to access those resources. So, so don't be shy. Fantastic. Well, thank <laughs> you to Amelia for being in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. um, I know we may not have gotten to everyone's questions, but we are going to move into our breakout sessions now and this is your opportunity to explore any of the content we've heard about this morning in more detail, but also um, any of the things that you came into this session really wanting to explore. Uh, so in the breakout sessions, for those of you who are comfortable, please use your video and your microphone so that it's easier to connect with everybody else in the room. Just to reiterate, we're not going to be recording the breakout session, so it won't be included in anything that we publish later. Um, so, to get there, 
can you go to the Engage Victoria page? Now, Dane's put the link in the conversation again in case you missed it earlier. So go into that Engage Victoria page, scroll past the beautiful social map that shows us where we're all coming from today and go down to the space called Breakouts. And stay here for a minute. Don't, don't disappear from this meeting for a minute. Um, <laughs> what you're going to do is consider those six breakouts uh, and go to one that you're interested in. For my lovely facilitators and coordinators, thank you so much for putting your hand up. I'm going to ask you to make sure you go to the one that you're assigned to, um, which we had emails about yesterday. So please make sure you go to the right room. Uh, our facilitators are going to help prompt the, the conversation and our coordinators are going to use the Engage Victoria tool to try and capture some of the conversation that's going on there. So the main objective of our breakout spaces is to have a great conversation and to get to know each other, learn from each other, share with each other, and if you can, try and document some of what you're sharing in that session. Now, as we go into this space, because we are moving into another virtual space, into another MS Teams and all the rest of it, if anybody gets stuck, come back to this main event where we are now and let us know in the comments because we're going to be working away in the background to follow up with you if you get stuck. Okay, so what you want to do is click on the button, like click on the particular group that you want to go and join. And in there will be a little button up the top that says to go to the breakout. Uh, so if you want to do that now, we will see you back here in about 15 minutes, I think about 15, 20 minutes, but we will come and get you from your rooms when it's time to come back. Ray briefly spoke about, from a government point of view, having policy around how you respond or when you respond on social media, just to make it really clear for everybody that when, when you know, it's appropriate to ignore things and when it's you know important to respond to people, that was about it. That's right, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael and Michael, can I please ask you to just mention what your topic is and let us know one insightful thing from the conversation you had. Um. I'm not sure if you can hear me, um, yeah, but um, yeah, our conversation was around um, tools. So there was some really interesting conversations around just the, the variety of tools that are available there and their uses. Um, also, I think, you know, a big, big topic that came up was also yeah. how to maintain um, attention as well. But, you know, it's, it's yeah. one of it's a space where there's obviously a lot of competing screen time. Um, or they're all screens. Um, so um, so that that was uh, then also, I think just dealing, I think especially in government around internal um, uh, approvals around various tools that, that are available to us. Great, great. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Holly and Amelia, would you like to talk about engagement now and, and what you looked at in your session? Sure, I'm happy to go first, Holly, and then shoot over to you. Um, so we actually workshopped Holly's project, um, um, which was cool. It was quite a unique, quite a unique project, project because it was focused on stakeholders, and the stakeholders are really busy at the moment because they're working on health and communications. They're, sorry, they're in the health and communications workforce services group, so they're in that field that's actually dealing with COVID right now. So um, the impact of the engagement on people's time was a really big factor and also how do we make the sessions useful for the stakeholders. So we talked about um, breaking down the project into different stages and the first stage um, maybe being an asking stage where we ask the stakeholders what, you know, if the former priorities, the priorities that they'd set as a group prior to COVID were still as important and um, what would be a good way? Would they rather engage deeply all at once or would they rather engage in short bursts over time? 
um, to complete what they'd committed to completing together. They were already using Engage Vic, so the focus of keeping people in Engage Vic was really um, a part of our discussion as well. So have maybe having a survey for those that first stage of the process, then having an ideation phase where perhaps they used um, Visioner or Gather or Conversation to come up with some ideas for what really had to be in those workforce plans that they were going to be producing and then a question of do we do a deep workshop on the plans together or do we just com um, come up with a template and send it out and people get a chance to have a play with that. Holly, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'm just really thankful that I got the opportunity to have a chat to you one-on-one -on -one, because I got a, a personal uh, <laughs> um, personal assistance with my project, but I think it was really good just to um, talk about, you know, checking in with the stakeholders around if this is still valid to them and this is still important work for them to do at this time. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely take that away. Thanks. That's fantastic. Excellent. Um, and I'll report back on reach and inclusion. Um, we had quite a vibrant conversation um, around this issue, particularly whilst doing all of our engagement online or in virtual spaces. So some of the things that people mentioned were that sometimes actually an online space can be a more respectful forum where people may not be as heightened as they might be in a face-to-face -face environment um, and that people have very quickly gotten used to the idea that we need to be respectful and listen to each other in online spaces because you can only have one person speaking at once. So that was, um, I, I thought, a really lovely insight. Um, when we were talking about who are we missing who aren't we reaching right now? Uh, some of the things that came up were people who have multiple levels of disadvantage, um, people with low digital literacy um, or low access to Wi-Fi and devices and things like that, uh, people with low levels of English uh, and young people and children. Um, but one of the lovely things that was mentioned in our in our session was uh, Angela mentioned doing a session with a whole bunch of year 10 kids. And uh, she was saying they kept their cameras off the whole time. But what they were doing was engaging in the chat. And after the session, she got fantastic feedback. And when she spoke to the teacher, they just said, this is what they do. That's totally normal. So I guess for us being people who are people people, you're used to really looking to the room to get that reassurance that people are engaged. Um, and I certainly feel that. Um, but maybe it's about acknowledging, well, how do young people engage? And if that's their normal, then we need to adjust our expectations and be okay with it. Did I do all right with that, Angela? <laughs> that, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I and I actually, yeah, can can say it was a public high school. I won't mention it, but yeah, I was told that's the new way that they engage with their students, provided you get, you get some great chat, um, and I did, and then I got good feedback afterwards. So I think that that was a good session. I learnt a lot in that session too. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. Well, um, please join me in a bit of a clap for all of our lovely facilitators and coordinators and thank you for taking on that role today. So um, so we're in the wrap up part of the session. Uh, we are going to finish on time at 12. But so you know, we are we have recorded this session, we're going to add a transcript to it. And then we're going to share it on our community of practice as a resource. Um, we'll be looking uh, with interest at what you captured on the Engage Victoria pages. Now, you all have access to all of those breakout spaces. So if you want to go and see what any other groups were talking about and what they captured in their space, we're going to leave this page open for quite some time. So go in and have a look at what the other groups were talking about. We're running online forums every month through the community of practice. So if you have an idea for an online forum or you want to work with me to deliver something, um, I'm open to all ideas and suggestions. So send me an email. You've all got my details um, or you can contact me through the community of practice. I'd like to thank 
Amelia and Dane from Engage2 for helping us make this happen today and for sharing fantastic insights and expertise with us. Uh, to Michael and Michael for being in the background to help me again, I'm so grateful. Before you go, if you scroll down that Engage Victoria page, you'll see that we've set up a bit of a poll and it's a really short uh, set of questions. I'd love you to give us some feedback because that will help us do this better every time. So uh, please go in and, and tell us how you went. And thank you all for choosing this session today and have a great long weekend. Signing off. See ya.